I've done my site prep and raised the grade about 18 inches. I've taken the time to ensure my water runoff is good to go, set up batter boards, and run my string lines. Next was pouring concrete footers and setting the piers. I even took the time to make some termite shields. I've got my sill plates cut, installed, and locked down. Rim joists are the next step in the building process. I am using 2x10s for my sill plates, rim joists, and joists. This is a 12 foot wide building with 16 inch on center spacing. A 2x10 joist can span up to 14 feet at a 40 pound per square foot live load. This puts me squarely inside code. Now a live load, in case you're wondering, is just a load that is variable inside of the building. So furniture, tools, people, uh, things that can be taken in and out, that counts as a live load. A dead load is just the weight of the building itself. So the calculation on your floor joists are actually quite important. In fact, undersized floor joists are one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make when building accessory buildings like this. They use two by fours for joists and then they park an ATV on it. Also keep in mind that this is an edited video. I'm not gonna show every nail being driven because well, that would be boring and stupid. But for reference, I went every eight inches or so and I did a combination of face nailing and toe nailing. There is code on all this and codes change based on where you live. In my area, we use the IRC, which is the International Residential Code with no overlays. Now what that means is that sometimes municipalities will overlay their own standards on top of whatever set of codes that they are using. So if the IRC says 16 inch spacing is good, the municipality can say, we think eight inch spacing would be better. So we would like that to be used. Then anything built within their jurisdiction would have to use the eight inch spacing instead of the 16 inch spacing stated in the IRC. And yes, that can get confusing very fast. And I've seen it lead to some heated debates in comment sections and discussion boards where one person says this and another person says that, when in reality, they both may be right. It just kind of depends on where you live. Now, I am not gonna bog these videos down with info like that too much. I really just wanna show the process that I go through and maybe show some of the struggles that I go through along with some of the successes. My only piece of advice would be to find whatever jurisdiction you fall under. Uh, go to their website and you should find their code information there. I mean, this is the 21st century after all. Uh, if not, pick up the phone, call reception if you have to, and they should be able to point you in the right direction for that information. Whatever you do, do not rely on YouTube videos and random websites for something as important as this. Now this board has a twist in it, so I drove a screw in at the bottom, then used my hammer to pry the twist out so that my end joist will sit flush. Alright, so I'm going to put my floor joist 16 inches on center, and on this tape measure, every 16 inches is a red number. So if you go out another 16 inches, there's a red number, and another 16 inches, there's a red number. So at every red number, I'm gonna come back three quarters of an inch and set ahead. Oh. 16, come back three quarters of an inch. So at 15 and a quarter, I'm gonna set ahead and I'm gonna make a mark that way, indicating that this is the side that the stud needs to go on. A speed square takes the small tick I made all the way across the top of my rim joist, making it more visible. Now 
We'll do the same on the other side. Now, you could take the rim joists, and before you attach them to the sill plates, put them together and measure all this out. Different strokes for different folks, I guess. I generally only do that with the top and bottom plates when I'm framing walls. Uh, I'll show that in a future video. I'm laying out all my floor joists in their approximate positions. These are 2 by 10 by 12s, by the way. Take a speed square and mark a line up from the inside of the rim joist. I'm going to do that on both sides. A speed square and a circular saw will square off both ends of my joists. Alternatively, just measure the distance between the rim joists. Mark that measurement on each board and cut it to length. This way, I don't have to measure anything. It eliminates the possibility of making a mistake while you're marking the length of a board. And anybody who's done construction or woodworking for any length of time knows that that is where you're most likely to make the mistakes.
All right, good morning. So I just snapped a chalk line from one end of the building to the other, and that is going to be where my blocking is going to go between my joists. Blocking is very important because it eliminates deflection in the floor. Uh, deflection will actually translate into a feeling of bounciness in the floor. It doesn't really show up in the camera all that well, but dimensional lumber is rarely straight. It usually bows along its length, especially in these longer lengths. So if you were to put the floor sheathing on top of the joists with no blocking, when you stepped on the floor, the joists will actually deflect to the side. And it's that side-to-side -side motion that translates into a perception of bounciness. Uh, even though it's not an up and down motion and it's actually a side to side motion that you're detecting. And my rule of thumb is I usually go every four feet on the blocking, which meant for this particular project, splitting the floor into thirds. Huh. You know what's aggravating? Is when you get through all that and you cut them all to the right size, except for the last one. Aggravating. <laughs> all right, there it is. Floor framing done. No bounce detected. Next comes the floor sheathing, and that'll be the next video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check me out at simplyeasydiy.com. Subscribe and like if you like.